Yes. Good um, evening, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues, um, students, teachers, um, principals, and um, the panelists. My name is Murali Tumarukudi. I am the operations manager for United Nations Environment Program Crisis Management Branch, normally based in Geneva. Due to COVID crisis, I'm working from home um, in Kerala at this point. But today, my work is not related to my official work, but something which is very close to my heart, which is education. The COVID crisis challenged every sector of our economy, but also education. Of the 1.6 billion students who are currently in the schooling space, which is from the nursery all the way to PhD, their studies were impacted. And around the world, teachers, ministers, teaching institution administrators were finding way to deal with the crisis. It is in this context that we thought we would get to hear from the Finnish system, which has a tremendous reputation for being innovative in education. When we started discussing this topic, we thought what should we call it? Should we give a very detailed title and I suggested that the very name Finnish education is enough for us to gather an audience. And as I said, we have more than 1,900 registrations so far. It shows the tremendous interest on this topic from Kerala, from rest of India, from rest of the world. So I have great pleasure today to moderate this session and I would introduce speakers one by one as they come to speak. Your mics have been muted, but please feel free to enter your questions in the Q and A section of your screen. We are going to follow it very closely and we would be responding to them. We will pick up many of those questions and give it to them, give responses to those questions. But we'll also be providing answers live to those questions. If you have any specific comments to make, you can always make that in the chat box and we will also be following it in the chat box. So without any further ado, I will now invite Dr. Anur Jinadevan who is a social entrepreneur, social policy researcher, and practicing dentist in Finnish government, who is currently based in Helsinki. He is a former senior lecturer of healthcare facility in Turku University of Applied Sciences. Dr. Anup is currently pursuing his PhD in social policy from University of Helsinki and a master in, master's degree in education, entrepreneurship from Oulu University. Of applied sciences. Dr. Anup holds a master's degree in healthcare quality improvement from the World Health Organization Collaborating Center, Faculty of Medicine, University of Helsinki, and a Bachelor of Dental Surgery from Dr. MGR University. Dr. Anup has extensive working experience over 22 years as a clinician and educator, both from India and Finland. With this very unique combination, I invite Anup to give a few words about the webinar. Over to you, Anup. Thank you, Murli sir. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, good evening and welcome to the international webinar on Finnish education. So this is organized by us, I said earlier, University of Helsinki Center for Continuing Education, HY Plus, CMI Congregation, Mentors for You, Sacred Hearts Academy, and Venture Village. So my name is Anup, Anup Jinadevan and I represent the organization Venture Village here. We are a Finland-based organization and we promote 
Finland educational methodologies in school level at, to let the children know the value of money from childhood, to know the importance of waste management, to understand sustainable living, to know about proper diet, oral health, girls' health, especially menstrual health, and many other fundamental topics missing in normal curriculum as co-curricular educational programs. As an opening remark, I would like to say that Finland is a small country with only 5.2 million people, uh, famous for its fantastic education system and is one of the best in the world. Certain facts are very unique to Finnish education system. Children in Finland do not go to school until the age of seven. They enjoy their childhood. There is no standardizing tests, no competition between children and no pressure during early childhood education. The focus of education is on overall development of the individual uh, with a strong civic sense, eco-friendliness, sense of equality, learning life skills and basic economics from early childhood. Teachers in Finland have, have to get a master degree to work. That means they are highly qualified, motivated, respected, and their professional status is close to doctors, engineers, and lawyers. Due course of this webinar, we, we hope that we could learn more about the Finnish education system and the possibilities and opportunities to collaborate with it. We could learn more about the compatibility of our new education policy in India towards the Finnish education system. And we could learn more about the importance of having innovative, phenomena-based, co-curricular learning program for the schools. Also, we hope that we could understand more on the expectations and perspectives from the Indian side towards Finnish education system. So as a co-host of this program, with immense pleasure, welcome to all our guests, participants, and registrants to this webinar. And from here on, the stage is yours. And thank you very much for this great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anu, for those opening remarks. Um, as Anu mentioned, Venture Village is one institution which is trying to promote some of the best practices of the Finnish model in India. And um, I would now invite Dr. Prasant Palakapalli, who is the principal of the Sacred Heart College. He has a PhD in social sciences from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And he was a faculty member of the Rajagiri College of Social Sciences, one of the pioneering social sciences institutes in Kerala. A good friend of mine, and it's always a pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Prashant. You have the floor. Am I audible and I'm visible? Yes, yes. Good evening and namaskaram to all of you. Uh, very pleased to be on this platform with you. I deem it a great honor and privilege. Yes, uh, uh, I think uh, we all look forward to learning from this, um, this platform. Uh, we pride ourselves at, uh, in Kerala about our school education in general. We feel that we are very good at that. But I definitely know that uh, very often our education is more uh, limiting than liberating. That's what uh, uh, typically education is uh, leading to. Uh, um, though there are, there are very many other positive elements. So, and we also, um, being a CMI, Kamala is a Mary Macleod with my contrary Father Martin leading our educational enterprise. We have a network of about 500 odd schools all over India and abroad, and about uh, 60 uh, colleges and a few techni technical, uh, technology based colleges and a uh, medical college and a university. So, with this vast network, I think maybe we would, we would be benefiting from learning as to how Finnish education could be. Um, put into practice here to make uh, education what it meant, means to be liberative. That's number one. Uh, uh, number two, I feel um, uh, in, in, uh, to what extent can this be practical in, in a state like Kerala or in India with its vast population and crunch of resources often, often uh, uh, said so. Maybe we have sufficient resources but we often say we have very limited resources. And the last thing, as Murli and also Jinadevan had rightly pointed out, the most fascinating thing is about the teacher, teaching profession or uh, pre profession of being an educator. 
how fascinating it can be and how free it can be and how liberating it can be. I think this could be a very learning uh, opportunity, especially uh, with the elections on and new poli policy of education having come into being. I think we are on a threshold where very many new things can be learned and put into practice. So uh, very pleased to be here. Sacred Heart College, though in higher education, we would be equally happy to learn more about uh, learning and the fundamentals of learning and uh, see in what manner can we be partnered with very other, many other institutions, including the uh, Venture Village, as to how we can carry on the mission of education for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Prashant. Uh, I now have the great um, pleasure and honor to invite two very distinguished guests from Finland. They work for an organization called HY Plus, which is established by the Helsinki University. And this is this institution is established precisely because there is so much interest around the world in Finnish education. And the Finnish ministers, prime ministers, and president going around the world is always requested for support on how to bring their best practices to other countries. So they decided to establish a full institution whose job is to promote such educational practices around the world. And they would actually be making a combined presentation. So I would introduce both of them together. So I have Ms. Minna Sade, who has 15 years of international experience in universities NGOs and the private sector, ranging from education, law, and environmental fields. Her true passion has always, however, been in education. For the past few years, she has been advising, designing, and leading customized training programs worldwide to enhance local education systems together with academic experts from the University of Helsinki. In her current position as a senior transnational education advisor for the University of Helsinki HY Plus Global Services, Minna has had the privilege of working closely with educational professionals in Finland, Middle East, and India. Welcome, Minna. I will also introduce Rika Halika, who is currently responsible for transnational education service development and related projects in Europe. Africa, Iraq, Egypt, and Palestine, with specialization in international financial institution funded projects. Ms. Halika has close to 20 years of experience in the field of internationalization of higher education and has been leading development cooperation projects in several African and Asian countries. Ms. Halika led the International Affairs Unit at the Diaconia University of Applied Sciences for 15 years and has worked as consultant and educational policy development expert for Finnish Ministry of Education in Eritrea with FCA and UNESCO in order to support the national teacher policy process. So we have this very interesting lineup, people with hands-on experience, people have assisted many countries in the past and continue to do so. As I mentioned, Finnish education has a great brand and great appreciation around the world, including in Kerala. So we are looking forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, we will uh, start uh, by thanking um, everybody uh, for organizing this wonderful event. It's, I, I feel truly honored uh, to be here uh, with you today. And now, as we all know, the world has changed, but hopefully we can also um, consider this event as a start for um, future collaboration um, between Finland and India in the education development. And uh, of course, uh, let's hope that uh, we will soon also get to meet each other um, again or for the first time. Yes, um, just a few words about um, University of Helsinki HY Plus and University of Helsinki 
Um, and thank you once again um, for the wonderful introductions um, of our team. Uh, I'm very happy um, that we get the opportunity to um, talk with you uh, today. So University of Helsinki Center for Continuing Education um, is responsible for uh, delivering transnational education services, education development, continuing education services, and also um, different project services uh, related to education sector. And um, all our services um, are developed in close, close collaboration with faculties. Uh, in this case, uh, in the education sector, of course, with the Faculty of Educational Sciences of the University of Helsinki. And um, we take a good care um, when delivering our services and designing our services uh, to work in very close collaboration with our um, clients or partners uh, in, in the education business. And we have a long history um, as a continuing education center within the university. So we've been providing um, um, evidence-based, research-based um, services uh, in Finland uh, for uh, over three decades now. Um, and currently, um, global services and international activities consist um, a great part of our business and of our work we do. Next one, please. And uh, as already mentioned, we are from University of Helsinki uh, and uh, work as the business unit of, of the university. And University of Helsinki, we are very proud <laughs> of, of our largest um, university in Finland. And university is also, University of Helsinki is also one of the highest ranking universities um, in the world, actually. Um, and it's clearly uh, the highest ranking university in Finland. Um, we, are, we are not, uh, we don't maybe have time to go to the numbers, but I'm happy to, to give more information about this as well. Um, maybe worth mentioning uh, before uh, letting Minna take the stage that uh, the Faculty of Educational Sciences of the university is also um, quite highly um, uh, ranked uh, in international rankings. So, um, so it's, it's very, um, and I'm very happy to also to be uh, presenting uh, for the faculty today. But uh, without any further ado, I know uh, you are eagerly waiting uh, to get to the actual content. I will, uh, I will ask Minna now to take the stage and continue with the presentation and uh, we'll be here the whole time for uh, any questions, comments, uh, sessions later on. So uh, I'm, once again, I'm very happy that and honored that we are here today. And, and now let's hear from Min. Thank you. Mina, you're on mute. My apologies. So thank you uh, from my part as well for the, all the organizers and thank you Rika uh, for the opportunity of being here. It's uh, very humbling that there are so many educators around the world who are interested on, on the way we do things up here in the north. Um, we are a small country, but uh, we are also uh, heavily invested on an education and this is also something that we are firmly um, believing on sharing our knowledge and, and localizing it in a, in a correct way in different parts of the world. But without, uh, we are pressed with time, so I'm gonna head to the main topic. <clears throat> Today, I'm gonna be talking about the uh, Finnish education system. I'm gonna give you a brief overview on what it looks like. Uh, I'm gonna touch base with the reforming of Finnish education system, uh, how it began and what is happening right now. I'm also going to introduce the different stakeholders in the schooling system and how our curriculums are built and, and uh, implemented. Uh, I'm going to touch base with the teacher training and a principal training that are in the core of uh, how we have been managing to handle the pandemic and keep our schools open. 
I'm also going to give you a brief uh, view on what we have done over here. Of course, uh, we are all in it together. So the pandemic is global and every country has to deal with it in the best way they can. But I can share, share with you what we have done over here and what we have learned from it. And I was also asked to share some of the information on how we can uh, collaborate with the, with the people around the world and how, what we have done uh, prior to the pandemic and what we are doing right now and what we are able to do after all of this is over as well. But without uh, further ado, let's head to the main topic. Hold on, why isn't this uh, changing the slides out there? So this is how the Finnish education looks like. Its basic foundations are that we provide equal right to quality education for all, regardless of their background, of their financial status, uh, of everything, or the location where they are in the country. We also believe that there is no uh, such a situation where a student is left behind, so there is no dead end in this system. Uh, we have always a safety network on if something happens and uh, redirecting your life course. And also that is free of charge from the uh, pre-primary school all the way up to the P uh, PhD level. These are all, all in our constitution and this is what the nation is firmly believing in. Uh, just to show you this, the, the bottom bracket over here, we have a pre-primary school education that begins uh, at the age of six, it's a one year training. And then there is a further nine years of basic education. So this bracket over here is mandatory for all the Finnish students uh, and the children in the country. Then there is, uh, uh, at the age of 16, the students make the decision of either uh, heading longer run on the higher education and the university track, or they go for the vocational that ends up in the University of Applied Sciences track. However, as you can see, the arrows are crisscrossing and going back and forth. And we believe that when you're 16, you can make the decisions for the rest of your life. Things happen, life changes, um, many things can come in the way, and or you just might change your mind and realize that this is not the career for you. So there are ways of uh, crisscrossing. So at the age of 16, you decided to go on a vocational qualification, you can still crisscross all the way up to the university track and the PhD track, if that is something that you have decided later in life. Now we uh, already talked about the PISA and I already the people over uh, the uh, presentations earlier already mentioned of the happiness uh, of the children in our country. So we all know that the PISA is something where Finland has been ranking high on uh, uh, ever since we joined uh, constantly. But what happens is when we uh, uh, factor in the life satisfaction, life satisfaction of, uh, of the students, you notice that the Finland is in a category of its own over here. In simple terms, this means that our children enjoy going to uh, school. We are trying to harvest the natural, uh, natural curiosity uh, towards learning and, and experimenting and making it fun. So academic, academics through uh, joyful and with the balance of, uh, of uh, free time and schooling. Uh, can I ask you, do you see this panel over here? So do I have to keep on moving it? I'm sorry, can you see the full screen? Without yes. the, the, yes. So I don't need to move that for, for, yeah. the, for that reason, sorry. So let's move on to the education reform in Finland. So back in the 1970s, the nation was in a crossroads where we needed to decide what is the future for this country. And a nationwide decision was made that we need to invest on an education. We're a small country in a, in a remote part of the globe. And in order to survive in a globalizing world, we need to see that education is in the heart of it all. Ever since we have had the continuous reform going on in this country. The reform doesn't stop. You might change one part, but then you need to see, uh, see and reform another part of it and constant research around it. What is the best, what worked and what didn't work. Professor Dr. Yari Lavanen from our own Faculty of Educational Sciences have been involved in several uh, international education reforms. 
and he says that education policies must be based on the long-term perspective that transcends government terms of office. This means that the, the political parties should not be involved in this and in Finland this has worked. So education is one thing that everybody can agree on and the importance of it. So after all these decades, we have managed to get to the point where we have equal rights for quality education for all. As I mentioned, no dead ends, no child left behind. And also very small margins difference between the schools in the entire country. So in Lapland, they are performing as well as in Helsinki. Education is free from the early education to the PhD level. We uh, had our last school inspections in 1990s. Uh, because of the heightened level and the quality of teachers, we are, we are able to trust that the quality is high everywhere without organizing uh, school inspections. We have also limited, uh, el eliminated the national standardizing test from the basic education. So our uh, students, the first uh, national test they're going to take is in a upper secondary level on the matriculation examination at the age of 18, 19. Higher education is merit-based because it's free. We need to also make sure that we get the quality students and the best ones get in. This also serves the interest of the students. So they are getting into the fields which is the most suited for them. Especially this is important for the teachers. As already mentioned, uh, the Finnish teachers carry minimum of master's degree and it's highly competitive to get in. So becoming a teacher is a choice and it is desired profession in this country and highly respected. Another key element is the principal training. So all our principals are teachers first. They have uh, qualified as a master, uh, getting their master's in education. Uh, they have some work experience as teaching and then they go on a further training to become principals. The advantage that this gives is the pedagogical leadership that they can give to the teachers and the support they need in their very autonomous uh, position as, uh, as uh, implementing the curriculum. The collaborative work is based on research. So the, as I mentioned, the reform keeps on going and we keep on researching and continuously trying to improve and answer to the questions of the future. Where should the education go? For instance, a national agency for education creates the policies for the education, but they do it in a collaboration with an academic experts, educational professionals and parents and even students. Uh, they, for instance, create the national core curriculum. During the pandemic now, we realized that these are one of those uh, foundations uh, that the education system can continue. And while affected by the pandemic, same as everywhere else in the world, we have been managing to keep our school open. We have been managing to keep our universities running and we have been able to uh, meet the learning targets that are set by the curriculum. So moving on to the curriculum. I'm going to uh, explain to you how the national core curriculum works in, in Finland and also who are the stakeholders in this and how the education is organized over here. So the national core curriculum is a binding document created every nine to 10 years. So going through the full cycle of basic education by the National Agency of Education in collaboration with an academic expert. So for instance, uh, there is a call for the university experts from our faculty to come and develop the next new curriculum. Uh, once they release one, they start working on another one. So we work on it for that nine to 10 years to uh, release the next one. National core curriculum is a framework. It's actually this thin document that uh, states the um, mentality, the idea, of what the schooling should look like, what are we looking at, and setting the general learning targets for each age group. It also talks about the school culture, the relationship with the home and uh, school, and the teacherhood and the role of the role of the principal. It also raises the, the key issues that should be addressed during the and focused on during the schooling. This national core curriculum is then taken to the local level, to the municipalities. The municipalities are uh, the uh, providers of schooling. So they run the schools around the country. This curriculum is then taken to the local level and uh, the implementation is localized. This means that even though in, compared to uh, India, for instance, Finland is obviously a small, small country, 
but it is very diverse. So the people and the nature and the surrounding areas are very different from north to south to east to west. So the implementation of the curriculum has to uh, be possible on all, all parts of the country and meeting the needs of the different uh, people in this country. The curriculum is then taken to the further localization to the individual school level. So the high level of autonomy uh, to run the school, uh, even though they are all public schools, uh, is given here and the curriculum is setting set to the framework of the individual school. It gives the pedagogical interaction between a teacher and a student and is supervised by the principals of the school. This curriculum is further uh, localized to the individual child level, creating a learning plan and also uh, serving the interest of the home and school collaboration. Over here, we believe that the schooling is not uh, sole responsibility of a school, but the education is a shared responsibility between the home and the school. And then through the collaboration between home and school, we get to the best learning results and uh, serve the well being of the children. Now, to the core of the teacher training. Uh, obviously, we're limited with time, so I could talk about an hour at least about the teacher training, how it happens in Finland. But to boil it down to the core of it is in this triangle that is presented over here. So we have the student teacher on the tip of it. We have a mentor teacher and a university lecturer. This creates the triangle where the pedagogical excellency lies, where the theory meets the practice. So the student teacher interacts with the university lecturers and learns the theory of the, of the pedagogy at the university, at the faculty. But she or he also needs to attend the practicum periods that start from the first year of the, of the studies and continue through the, all, the uh, all the years there in the university in the different levels. At the university practicing schools, the Helsinki has two university practicing schools and all the universities in Finland uh, who has a faculty of educational sciences own schools. These uh, schools are actually departments of the faculty. However, they uh, act as a neighborhood schools and they act, uh, provide the, follow the normal national core curriculum and they are um, regular schools, apart from the fact that the staff uh, are also dominantly researchers, as well as they teach our children. So in these schools, our student teachers learn how to teach in practice. They start by observing and then they move on to teaching themselves. This is to making sure that the theory that they learn at the faculty is, uh, is having a touch base with the practical elements. Furthermore, the, men, uh, the staff and the faculty at the schools are also researchers, so they communicate with the university faculty and then the theory and a the practice also uh, mix there and get uh, confirmed and serve the interest of developing the education. Now, this means that our st teacher students and, uh, and the uh, teachers in general um, are highly motivated and self-critical which has served, the, served the, the exceptional times we're having right now. They are self-direct and responsive to unknown new challenges. They recognize conditions and they are able to adjust. They understand the core of the curriculum and how to implement it and deliver uh, in order to meet the learning targets. So even if they can't do what they used to do before the pandemic, they are able to change and uh, re, uh, readjust. They also understand the meaning of change to the students and parents, and they understand that this is, these are exceptional times and very scary times as well. They ensure the feeling of safety and continue as normal as possible in the given situation. So in short, they are able to assess, accept and adjust to the current situation due to the high level of training and, uh, and the practice in the, in the field of education. The same applies for the leadership. So as I mentioned earlier, the principals in this country are all teachers first, and then they uh, uh, do further education to become principals. This gives them the pedagogical understanding of the realities that the teachers uh, are facing inside the classrooms. Again, this is something that has um, played a very uh, big role in the pa uh, pandemic uh, period. So our principles are self-direct and responsive to unknown new challenges. 
they recognize the conditions of their own school and they recognize the core functions of their own school. So they're able to uh, pick and choose what is important and what is not on every given day. They understand the meaning of change and protect the faculty, students and parents. So they make sure that the teachers, when they come to work, they feel safe doing that and they get support they need. They uh, are uh, communicating with the students and parents and making sure the parents feel safe to send their kids to schools during this period of uh, exceptional times. These principles are also able to focus on the core of the leadership elements and lead to the learning, uh, that learn, uh, lead to the learning results. Again, they're able to identify what is important, what is not, and what can we cut out that we can't deliver at this time, but what is that we need to find a new ways of doing. And importantly, they ensure the feeling of safety and continues as normal as possible in this situation. I contacted our principal of our schools before this, uh, while preparing for this uh, event. And I asked him, what is the one thing that is in the core of all of this? And he said, the schooling must continue as normal as possible. And we need to just keep on moving. Now, what really happened in Finland then during this year? On the 16th March, 2020, the state of emergency was declared in Finland. Many schools were given 48 hours warning to move from contact teaching to distance learning, except for early education. Strong recommendation for people to keep their early education children at home was given. So this meant, I, for instance, I had to keep my five-year-old home because I was able to work from distance. This released the capacity for the people and the parents who couldn't, uh, couldn't stay at home and work from distance. For instance, the medical workers and others. And this way, the early education uh, was uh, given the opportunity to conduct uh, education in a safer way by releasing the capacity there. On the 14th of May, 2020, the basic education returned to the normal education and limits of the other institutional, uh, educational institutionals were lifted. University made the decision to uh, maintain in the distance learning. This was done because it was considered highly important for the well-being of the children to be able to finish their school year. There was two weeks left of the school year at the time. And they did. And we, uh, we noticed that the infection rates did not go up. So everything worked perfectly, thankfully. Came the summer break from May to August. And during that summer break in June 2020, uh, the, our parliament passed a new law. They made the legislative change to grant more independency to the municipalities to make their decisions case by case. Uh, prior to this, uh, if one school was closed due to the infections, um, all the uh, schools were uh, following the suit. Now the municipalities were given more independence to do, make these decisions and close schools one at a time or, or everybody on a district or just one class was sent home. In August 2020, schools opened normally and operated with the hybrid model. And this is where we are at the moment still. Universities to maintain distance learning for the duration of the whole academic year. And we just got a message that our university at least is gonna keep, the, keep on going with the distance learning until the end of the June this year. Fall came and in the December 2020, upper secondary was moved to the distance learning. Again, we're moving on a hybrid model where part of the school can be closed and the other part is uh, still remaining open. This part, the virus had mutated uh, and attacking a younger, younger people, and this is why the upper secondary was considered to be at risk. At the same month, the vaccinations of the medical staff began, and we are moving with the vaccination program now. So hopefully within the next, next six to eight months, we are closer to the uh, closer to the uh, uh, normality. Last, uh, in January 2021, the last year of upper secondary returned to contact learning due to the upcoming matriculation examinations. So, uh, of course, the matriculation examinations are so important. We kept the first and the second graders at home, but the third graders got back into school to be able to fully uh, fully benefit from the contact learning in the half empty school now. Continuous response to Finnish Institute of Health and Welfare recommendations is, uh, is how the, the schools are uh, doing their 
uh, recommendations and basing their decisions on from. Now, what have we learned from this? We have learned, and not all of it has been negative. So this is also the lessons learned and some of these things are gonna continue with us. What we have learned during this year are gonna continue with us even after things go back to normal. For instance, smarter and more efficient leadership. We are no longer tied to the location and nobody insists on people to stay around the same table anymore during the meetings and things. This releases the, the time from the teachers to go, uh, go home and prepare for the next day's lessons before the meeting set for the next time of the day, for instance. Focus has been put on a digital pedagogy and digital readiness and the teachers have been supported on this. Also, uh, this is the we have realized that digital pedagogy is a lot more important than the digital tools we use and the teachers uh, are taught how to smartly choose the tools they're needing and so they target the lear uh, learning better. Parents and students appreciate school better um, and adjusting to working methods is more important than a physical element. So we have realized that the wild change in the way we work is a lot more beneficial than adding uh, protected gear or, um, or focusing on the physical elements that could uh, prevent the virus spreading. We need to adjust our way of working, not, to, not at the barriers. The interpretation of the national level guidance has been challenging, report the, uh, the principles, but since they increased the level of the autonomy, this has eased up the situation a lot and they are able to focus on what is important. The school community uh, should have a common understanding of distance learning. So the importance of communications has been put in a focus. So students, parents, faculty, and the leadership are fully in an understanding on what we are doing and what, why we are doing this and how we're doing and what is everybody's role in it. Also supporting students at home has been in a focus. So they are uh, contacted daily. If a student is isolated at home, teachers must contact them daily and make sure they are doing okay. Teachers' capabilities to adjust to the curriculum obviously has been in a focus and they have learned very creative ways on utilizing different methods on find, uh, getting to the learning targets and identifying what, are, what is in the core of the learning targets. Teachers are able to subsidize each other regardless of the subject matter. So we have had cases where a math teacher has been doing uh, English lessons uh, temporarily, et cetera which has enlarged the capacity when people have been uh, staying home for uh, common flus and things more this year because of the precautions. So we have had the, uh, sufficient enough capacity to keep the uh, schools open. And teachers are able to teach the hybrid model and teach even with their self in quarantine. So we have cases where the teacher has been at home and the, school uh, the students have been in the school or part of the class is at home and the teacher is at school and part of it's there. Regardless, they have been able to adjust to this and, and continue the schooling. And again, keep everything as normal as possible, focus on the core, adjust and move everything you can online. Now, I also asked the principal that I called, I asked some practical tips, so what have they done in the schools? He said that the focus have been put on the infection chain. So they have minimized the student group uh, sizes and, uh, and mixing of the different groups. If possible, they've been utilizing the service of one teacher or at least minimizing the number of teachers that are in touch with the student, uh, this student group. They have focused on hygiene, of course, but this has meant that they have to adjust the daily schedule. So you have to give more time to wash the hands when you have one sink in a classroom, etc or more time to move to the lunches or break times and move them uh, in, a, in a way that not everybody's in the corridors at the same time. Uh, unlike the Finnish uh, model, usually we have moved to more teacher-led teaching because of the situation, less group works, or we have moved them online. We have removed the lockers and moved the backpacks, so all the students are carrying what they need daily in their bags. They utilize the architects of the school, so taking claiming the empty spaces in the schools and also the utilizing flexibly the spaces that are left empty because some groups are working from distance. They are also utilizing outdoor spaces around the year now, and they're taking, for instance, emergency access to make the people flow uh, better. 
They have uh, even put in a sticker tape on the ground, so making sure that the flow in the corridors is uh, able in the social distancing for the students. They have moved uh, everything extra online. So even though it's not the same, but the graduations, the staff meetings, parental meetings, any other school events, they're all taking place in line now. And everybody understands that this is something we need to do at the moment. Now, let's move to the, some of the things that the HY Plus has done during the pandemic and prior to it. So let me introduce how we operate first. We are firm believers that any country striving for the economic growth or positive social change must invest on an education. HY Plus helps in this, uh, this work by uh, operating with governance and governments, institutional and individual level. We evaluate, we design solutions and we execute those. And all of this is based on the latest pedagogical research that we get from the University of Helsinki. Now, Rico already mentioned that we are uh, a company owned by the University of Helsinki, so we're kind of the commercial arm. Uh, we are the middleman between the academic expertise and our collaborators and partners around the world. Our job is to speak to our uh, partners and the local people uh, and uh, map out the needs that are there and find uh, localized solutions and how to deliver them in a sustainable way. Now, since March 2020, we had to move all our operations online. And like Rika, I'm hoping this is going to change at the end of the year and we can start traveling again and seeing our friends, partners, and collaborators around the world. Now, these are some of the examples that we did before the pandemic. So as you can see, on 2018, we started a reform project in Ukraine. Uh, uh, this is funded by our own Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland, and it is to modernize the Ukrainian education system, improve the teaching and learning, and uh, focus on 21st century requirements, and also making it equal uh, opportunities for all in schooling in Ukraine. Pandemic came but we are still continuing this project and we haven't changed the time frame or anything. So we are able to uh, work, which makes us happy, of course, even during these conditions. Prior to pandemic, we had a lot of uh, um, larger professional capacity building programs, some of them taking place in, a, in the local areas and some of them taking place uh, in Finland. This is one example of the uh, group of South Korean educators who came to Finland at the end of the year 2019 to learn about how we do things in Finland, how our education system works, how our teacher training works and uh, school ecosystem and school culture. To learn about this, to implement it themselves on their own uh, education system and uh, updating their own education system in South Korea. We do shorter trainings on the locations as well. This is a positive pedagogical leadership and playful learning on early education in Lebanon with it in 2019. You can see here is the, uh, the professor, Dr. Yonna, uh, who is actually teaching to these 200 Lebanese early educators math through the bubbles. And then came the pandemic. And we had to respond to the new norm as well at the HY Plus and find the ways and create new uh, solutions for this situation also globally. So immediately in March uh, 2020, we were contacted by the Emirati of Sharsha of the Education Academy for uh, cr uh, creating them a training for distance uh, teaching and learning. So they contacted us on Tuesday and by Saturday we were training them online on how to use digital tools, how to move all the, all the learning and teaching online. And they were doing that in the following week. We continued our collaboration with, uh, with Sharsha and uh, we just finished uh, two trainings at the end, early this year on leadership during the exceptional times and about the inquiry based learning for the early educators. So I'm going to go through them quickly, just an examples on the on the some of the uh, tested and trial trainings that we have done during these times, uh, and we are happy to offer also globally on other people. So here is the uh, leadership during the exceptional times. Uh, this was the examining the different sides of the leadership and what had to change during the pandemic. 
The training was given by our own principals, Dr. Tapio Lahtero and uh, Principal Ilka Larsson. And so it was a peer to peer training for the principals talking to principals, because these are the, as said, uh, different times and we need to focus on the practical solutions uh, more than on the theory. We had 250 school leaders taking part in the training and uh, very happy to learn about the, of the different uh, leadership styles from the distance, uh, how to lead the community of professionals, how to motivate them, and how to keep the focus on students supporting them and their learning results. Uh, I mentioned earlier the training about the teachers from the distance. And now since the times have changed since March, we have also developed another training uh, focusing on the hybrid model. What is the hybrid model? Uh, uh, what kind of solutions there are to utilize it? Uh, what kind of materials can you use and how to keep the focus on students and the different learnings and different needs and how we keep them motivated because this is extremely tiring also for the students. This is also given uh, by our own Anni Lokomies from our own university practicing school who is teaching hybrid day in day out nowadays. So she knows what she's talking about. And then we have the, for the early learners also up to the primary level. We, uh, we did the training on inquiry-based learning for 400 uh, early educators just a few weeks ago. Um, as the inquiry-based learning is also easy to take to distance if required. And it gave a short uh, uh, three-day training on what is inquiry-based learning and why we should utilize it on early education and early years. Why is it so effective and how we get the results and how do we assess those results and outcomes in a different ways. We also offer some online self-study courses. While I say it's a self-study, we also recommend these to be uh, taken in as a whole school because this has a larger impact uh, on, the, on the entire school culture if uh, more than one teacher is, uh, is learning about these things. Also, it is better for the teachers to have peer support and they can, for instance, utilize the lessons learned and start uh, school improvement projects within the school while, while studying this course. It is a, a one-year course that, uh, as the name says, is STAR Lessons. So it is meant for the good practices, methods, and giving a motivation for every teacher. It is based on the Finnish education solutions to enhance the skills of uh, already uh, good teachers, but get into the modern pedagogy, pedagogical models and practices and the 21st century skills, and also now digital learning. We have already users in Uzbekistan, China, and India, and in Finland for this course. If somebody is interested, please contact me on this. And for this, uh, this part uh, participants uh, only, and for this webinar, we are opening the um, inquiry-based learning for, uh, through STEM course for individual um, participants. Usually, again, this is the same, uh, same reason we uh, want to reach for the larger impact. And we already have feedback from the, from the users of different early education units that this has, as said, quickly become a staple of a sort of a lifestyle for the school. And this is only uh, possible if uh, a large enough number of teachers are uh, embracing these practices. But however, these are also very good tools and, and uh, way of learning the inquiry-based learning uh, as an individual online. The course is built in a way that the theory meets the practice. So there's a very short part of theory, and all, uh, but it guides you to the practical implementation of the lessons learned. You don't need to be uh, understanding science prior. The course also teaches you what is the science behind the, all the lessons. And you, you learn yourself as well. It's, it's actually very interesting. Um, the course is suitable uh, for the teachers who teach uh, very young children up to the three-year-olds all the way up to the primary school because the, it also teaches you how to teach on different age kids even in the same classroom and how to utilize and adjust to the uh, correct age level, the lessons learned. There's 60 hours of versatile materials, including lesson plans, teaching methods and assessments. Um, 
And these uh, mes uh, lessons also uh, work from the distance. So if you have a situation where, where your unit is closed, you can also utilize these uh, lessons and, and take them to the distance learning. Uh, the materials that you use for the science experiences are uh, cheap. They are everyday household uh, things, so you don't need to have uh, uh, specific science labs to, to learn about these things. We have a course for this course. We have users in China, in Lebanon, in Finland, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Minister of Education in Thailand is utilizing this course and in Hong Kong at the moment. And of course, uh, all of these courses come with the certificate of completion from us after you finish the course. We have also given a small discount on the, on the course on the license fee for this webinar participants. So if you are interested in, uh, there is the link over here where you can purchase it directly to, uh, as an individual. Uh, the organizers have also promised to send the presentation so you don't need to make the decision right now. You can, you can uh, wait to receive the presentation after this seminar. But that's all for me. I'd like to thank you all. Kitos. Um, there is a QR code where you can directly link to me in uh, LinkedIn. I'm happy to continue this conversation, but both on the on the Finnish education system, the pandemic, and also if anybody is interested on the solutions, please contact me or my colleague Rika, and we are happy to continue this talk. And for now, kitos. Thank you, Mina, for this extremely uh, interesting presentation. And also, Rika, there is a lot of ground you have covered, and people do have um, questions. And I would um, come back to you with the various questions um, after we have a couple of small presentations. I learned a lot about the system, you know, a lot more than what I knew. And it is very interesting to know that you are actually granting even more autonomy to the municipalities and teachers during this crisis. You now, which means there's a trust-based system, which is something which we have to get used to. I now have the pleasure of inviting Ms. Neeraja Janaki, who, uh, who is actually well known to the Kerala audience, because she writes, frequently on matters relating to education and careers. She has a MPhil in psychology from the MG University and has experience in teaching in the schools as a school counselor. And currently she is a startup, she's running a startup called Mentors for You, which provides career advice to students, teachers, as well as parents. Nirja also was incidentally a student at the SY Plus organized event in Helsinki last year, probably your last real program, uh, visit program, and where she picked up a lot of uh, ideas about the Finnish system. And she would actually be speaking about how the Finnish system can be implemented in India, in Kerala, and how the new educational policy would facilitate that. We just have released a new educational policy and how one will fit with the other. Nirja, you have the floor. Am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hello all, I'm truly honored to be in this platform. Um, Dr. Murli, thank you so much for your kind words. As Dr. Murli mentioned, I'm currently running a career mentoring and life coaching facility, Mentors for You. Actually, I have heard a lot about uh, Finnish education and their success stories. As a person who is interested in the field of learning and education, I really wanted to explore how their system works and how they successfully manage it. So I attended uh, HY Plus a due visit program in 2019 November and spent a week in Finland. So the program was a mix of lectures, uh, meetings, you know, uh, institutional visits and all. So we visited schools, including Finnish and Swedish speaking schools and some training institutions as well. 
Uh, actually, I was with, uh, witnessing how a phenomenon based learning, that's the speciality, it prepares the learners to solve problems using practical skills instead of passively learning concepts and abstract ideas. So uh, when we see such a highly functioning system, uh, we should realize that it, it doesn't happen overnight. It took time and effort. So uh, in my understanding, beyond political ideologies, people and government consistently stood for it. Actually, this will not be possible you know, without maintaining continuity in quality as well as in policies. So uh, coming to India, uh, we need to think about what we can learn from Finland, uh, what we can adopt from their system. Is there any possibilities of collaborations? So uh, there I find India's new education policy, uh, the national education policy 2020, it has a potential to get along with the Finnish model in some areas. So uh, we are going to discuss that. So coming to the NEP and the Finnish system, I'll start from the beginning, the early childhood care and education. So this is one of the most significant inclusion in national new education policy. Uh, so which is applicable to the three to six year old children, the age group that that we consider as the foundation period of learning. So in Finnish system, they give uh, very much importance to early education, uh, early childhood education and care and the pre-primary education. So uh, there is a slight structural difference between a Finnish system and uh, which mentioned in the new educational policy. Still the concepts get along well, I think. Uh, the other one is vocational education. Uh, currently our, uh, India's, edu India's vocational education largely focus on 11th and 12th grades solely. Uh, so the new education policy, it brings in vocational education programs um, to mainstream education. Actually, it starts from uh, middle and secondary schools and continue to college university level. It gives an opportunity to connect with various vocations along with their regular studies. Uh, for instance, if I'm a student with a major in bioscience, I could learn uh, web design or a carpentry along with my major subjects. So uh, this is going to happen. So in Finnish system, they give much emphasis on vocational training. Uh, the structure is slightly different uh, from the upper secondary level. Uh, there are two different set of sets of institutions or streams one can choose. One is vocational um, stream and the other one is general one. So um, even in the university level, they have uh, the differences. Um, I think um, Ms. Minda already mentioned it. So I'm not going to the details. Then uh, focus on teacher training. That's the uh, next level. So. Finland system gives special attention to the quality of teachers. So teachers have freedom to design the lessons, foster their students. They trust their teachers. There is a culture of trust actually. Also, uh, those teachers are extremely capable of doing it. I must say something about their training system as well. So uh, their minimum qualification of a teacher, even in the primary, pre-primary section session, is a master's degree. So one important change in the NEP uh, that proposed extensive training for teachers of all groups, irrespective of their areas. So uh, mainly setting up professional standards for teachers. That's another point. So there will be a guideline, a national professional standards for teachers by 2022 as per the NEP. Uh, another major difference is BA degree, that is the Bachelor of Education. Uh, this training becomes a four-year degree program. So uh, this is another point, which is, you know, there's a scope where we can inculcate the Finnish um, strategy. Uh, another important point is um, importance of language. There is a scope for learning more languages according to our new educational policy. So according to the NEP, there is a three language formula. As per this provision, a student should learn any three languages. We have 22 official languages and other languages, but uh, the students, uh, the, you know, uh, the state can choose these languages. Um, 
one important thing is uh, emphasis in mother tongue new education policy suggests uh, whenever possible the medium of instruction until at least grade 5 but preferably till grade 8 and beyond will be the mother tongue or home language so in finnish system also they give importance uh, for learning languages um if i'm right uh, there should be uh, a student should learn mother tongue a national language and a foreign language so um this is these are the major points that i wanted to discuss um we all you know we have always heard about the finnish education system as a successful system that has been practicing for decades and globally recognized one i think many of these innovations can be included in our education system so um we can discuss further in our q and a session if possible thank you so much for the time and patience thank you nirja for your um, kind introduction to the new education policy and how it aligns in many ways with the finnish system when we come back we may ask you a bit about your experience in actually going to finland and seeing some of with first hand we now have a final presentation brief inter um, intervention from mr unnikrishnan kurup who is an engineer and serial entrepreneur with over 15 years of experience in the it industry he holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from kannur university kerala and he is also pursuing master's degree in education entrepreneurship from olu university of, of applied sciences nikrishna is based in finland and spends his time working for his startups in finland and india he serves in the role of managing director of venture village while spearheading product development in his high tech startups before becoming an entrepreneur unikrishnan has worked for mncs like tata consultancy services tech mahindra and has served as a consultant in companies like nokia magrafil etc i noticed that be it engineers or doctor who go to finland suddenly get excited by the finnish education system and start to learn about it which is ex extremely good to know Thank you, Ni. Uh, you are currently on mute, so you have the floor now. Okay. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful for this opportunity to speak uh, uh, in such a you know, uh, webinar. So I'll share my screen now. Just tell me. Um, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. My name is uh, Unikrishna Askuru. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Venture Village, and uh, today I'll be talking about co-curricular learning. So, um, I have a, a different perspective about uh, Finnish education. So, like, I'm an Indian uh, uh, who is educated in India, and uh, i'm currently doing my uh, masters in uh, education and entrepreneurship here in finland and also i'm uh, i have i'm a parent of two two children who are actually uh, going uh, into school in the finnish education system so sharing the same perspective that's how uh, me and uh, my friend and the co-founder of enter village dr anup jayadevan uh, actually uh, thought of uh, bringing the best practices and like Uh, what is practical uh, to bring to india and uh, we started researching on that and that's how actually venture village was actually born so let me start off this presentation with uh, a quote so the quote reads uh, one of the aims of the new finnish national curriculum is to educate civilized and enlightened people so let me repeat that the key part there is the educate civilized and enlightened uh, people so it's from a book uh, named phenomenal learning from finland it's written by an acclaimed author kristi longa so i would recommend this book if you want to know more about uh, the finnish education system so it is uh, this this quote has stuck with me uh, from the time i have read this book and like uh, this kind of encompasses like what our thoughts are behind when we actually set up something like this so uh, the question that we asked ourselves is like what is the like finnish think tank uh, thinking of developing or how are they planning to prepare the next generation of uh, school children in finland 
and uh, like we researched a lot we read publications we read books and we talked to experts here in finland we talked to schools in uh, uh, kerala and uh, we managed to uh, you know f- f- find out like few skills that would be key uh, and that needs to be uh, you know uh, brought to india and as part of our research we came up uh, with these seven points so before i go through this seven skills uh the heading that i want to read it again so what's essential for the next generation regardless of their career so irrespective of the career path that the child chooses like what are the skills that are needed so this is actually uh, from the uh, finnish road map for the 21st century competence these are many things that are actually happening now in finnish education so let me go through one uh, each uh, uh, every one of these seven skills like uh, in brief so developing thinking skills and uh, learning to learn so this is mostly about the inquiry based learning like questioning the things that you actually uh, read and see in the textbooks and also like this this uh, helps the children to develop critical thinking skills and uh, creative and insightful thinking skills and also like uh, learning to learn is more like how do you say like control over one's learning skills how good a learner you are what are the things that you need to do actually to learn a, a skill or a, a concept properly so it's basically about discovering strengths and weaknesses so this is one of the key skills that they are actually focusing on here the second one is the cultural competence uh, interaction and self expression so this has mainly to do with you know building a cultural identity for of yourself like finland is a multicultural country there are the work spaces here are like uh, multicultural even in india of course from people, when we are working with people from different states it's a multicultural element so having a, an identity for yourself respecting others as well as you know your own culture like uh, in a in a in a workplace or in a uh, in an environment where you are able to interact and express yourself properly may that be an idea or like an emotion that you want to share with your peer so that is the key concept here like cultural competence interaction and self expression the next concept uh, or the next idea or the skill is self care and managing everyday life so this is this has more to do with the uh, time management and like i think this is very important in the current uh, age because there is a lot of self regulation required in the digital age like when you are looking for them sort of from a very young age here in, in finland like and then of course it takes care of the well being and health like taking care of yourself and you know what is like uh, what is personal privacy all those skills are actually uh, uh, incorporated in this and then there is the multi literacy skills so when you come to that like uh, uh, you can express yourself in so many ways so it's about uh, you know different uh, modes in multimedia like you want, how you want to express yourself uh, like creating a video or like you know using a presentation or even to how to interpret somebody else's presentation or a video to identify what is correct what is not correct like when you see a video it's like in, in this uh, modern world it is very important to critically analyze a video or a content that you actually see so this is a very very important skill that is given focus here and then there is the ict skills ict skills are uh, they have a lot of focus in india also but it's not just about the coding skills that is focused here so it's, it's more about like um, how do you say responsibility and safety while you are actually in in, in a uh, in a by using technology so like social interaction interaction and networking skills what is right what is not right when you are actually interacting online so those things are also given a lot of importance here then the next one is working life skills and entrepreneurship so here like uh, let me give you an example like uh children of 8th and 9th grade are supposed to go for a program called tet in finnish it is theo elman tutustuminen or it actually translates to working life familiarization so at a young age when they are in the 8th standard and 9th standard itself children are supposed to go to some kind of a working environment could that could be a bakery that could be a cafe that could be an it uh, company that could be like any any uh, any environment like but they need to get a Uh, experience of working life from that age and it is mandatory for children also and then like it also uh, teaches you the social interaction skills and networking skills etc and then the last one is uh, the uh, participating influencing and building a sustainable future this is basically to uh, build a pro environment behavior in in children like uh, to build a sustainable future so the thing is that your next generation should be proud of what you have done currently like with the environment with the resources you have that that is actually given a lot of importance from a very young age here is that that is what we have actually seen so uh, taking all of these uh, points all of these seven skills like uh, we uh, it was like a very very eye, it was a big eye opener for us taking all of these skills 
like we incorporated all this into kind of a three uh, simple terms which we want to actually focus on that is to mold entrepreneurial citizens environmental champions and responsible leaders like as a company you can see these three terms in, in our vision and mission statements and in the blogs that we write but our idea is that like, there is a lot of uh, uh, say scope or like there is a lot to be done to mold a new generation of india who are entrepreneurial citizens and environmental champions and responsible leaders but then how to do it that's where the co curricular part comes in there is like a lot of time and effort spent in the curricular activities like this uh, like for the competitive exams you know uh, like getting good marks and getting into good professional colleges and then there is a lot of time and effort being spent on the extracurricular activities also may that be football or cricket training or music training etc but then we wanted to uh, like similar to what uh, how many of these programs are done in finland we wanted to put in these activities as co curricular activities within this academic calendar of the school without affecting any of the other plans that they have like exams or any of the other things the the things that they have planned so like it is ideal to have these programs similar to here that like it is happening like every week one or two hours but then it goes on for one month but still the kids enjoy it and like they learn a lot of things and like uh, they develop a, a lot of new knowledge around these skills that we actually discussed so uh, this is the uh, path that we actually took after researching a lot from uh, film now uh, what is the impact so uh we are actually already doing this program uh, let me give an example for of this green city uh, program actually i'm i'm glad that i think there are there are many teachers in this webinar uh, attending here who are actually mentor teachers of this program here uh, in schools in kerala so around 3000 children are actually doing it right now but uh, it is a program on sustainability and waste management it's not just that like they learn something and write an exam or something but it's mostly to uh, develop critical thinking skills you know go around and find out environment issues near their home and then find a solution create a project submit it etc it's it's like and then uh, uh, we have like uh, programs like future city it's not an online program but it is where the children learn about money about tax about profit loss how to run a company on their own basically they will learn a lot within one or two weeks and then for one day they will be running a simulated city on their own like playing the roles of government public works part election committee bank i'm not going to explain more and then there are uh, these programs what we have there is a lot of important link of cycling and circular uh, circular economy and the social entrepreneurship as a growth engine so we are focusing on this and we are focusing on uh, giving this to uh, uh, youth of the age 18 and above so all of these courses can be actually accessed in uh, uh, our learning platform called learning.venturevillage.world these are actually uh, live now the children are doing it and actually that's that's what uh, mainly what i want to do uh, concentrate and you know explain but then on uh, going on the same line uh, on this uh, uh, new skills we are introducing uh, programs on you know, girls health menstrual health and uh, oral health so those we are actually following the same path what are the next 21st century skills that are needed for children and uh, we are going ahead so uh, that's what uh, from uh, the different perspective that uh, me and uh, my co-founder had and to developing programs uh, that we have and running uh, now uh, in kerala and india thank you all uh, thank you for listening to me uh, that's it that's that's it from my end thank you um only for this uh, extremely interesting insight and it has given a very clear structural way of looking at what the education is meant to achieve we are very happy to know that uh, you are already working in kerala and uh, if people are interested you already have questions from the audience as to how can they collaborate and uh, so if you could just uh, pick up those questions and answer to them that would be very useful that would you know meant the purpose of this webinar is being served um i had very cooperative speakers they all spoke within their time thank you i now have the most challenging part because we have lots and lots of questions which has come in we'll try to answer as many as possible um but it's a very good problem to have that we have a lot of questions the bad problem would be that when we do not have enough questions so um i thank all the speakers once again but then i want to start with uh, mina or rika 
the question is about educating differently abled children in Finland. How is it handled? Are there special schools? Are there special teachers? Uh, I believe Maybe. Rika would be the better one to answer this question. Here yes. I am. Thank you. Yes, Rika. Yes. Um, well, uh, the Finnish uh, system um, is inclusive. So um, even differently, uh, differently able children are, if possible, they are integrated um, in the normal, normal uh, school class. Um, and um, um, I was wondering if I could share, maybe we don't have the time, um, but basically we have uh, for um, anybody, it doesn't, uh, I mean, the child ha doesn't have to be, um, for instance, differently abled um, with a disability or a handicap, um, but the general uh, support uh, and our inclusive education system uh, it's for everybody, every learner. So we have a, uh, what we call a free tier support. Uh, and for gen general support, um, it can be um, like a situation in the family, for instance, or it can be um, something very minor uh, for uh, which, which affects um, child's learning. Um, and then, um, he or she is entitled to this general support. Um, we um, then, if we move on uh, with the inclusive education system in Finland, then the second level um, is what we call uh, intensified support. Um, and then uh, we will once again um, change some things. Basically, all the children go to their nearest school and then uh, they have the opportunity to learn there. But if, uh, if we need to um, provide some additional support, uh, also uh, we are able to, to do that by adjusting some of the things. I can give more examples of, of the actual uh, changes we make um, to ensure the support. And then uh, the third tier uh, is intensified uh, oh, oh, sorry, special support, uh, and only at this stage we will draw, or the school, together with parents and the learner, or the pupil, um, um, him or herself, and and also also um, the school uh, well-being group uh, is part of that. Only at the third stage uh, we draw uh, what is called an inclusive education plan. So, um, so uh, we, this is the system of, of um, uh, inclusive education in Finland. And um, um, for instance, for general support or intensified support, we, we don't uh, need a diagnosis, for instance. This is something that um, I'm asked a lot. Um, uh, should there be a diagnosis for, for the child before uh, he or she can um, get um, general support or intensified support or special support. No, uh, that's not necessary. Um, so um, every child has a right uh, to go to the nearest school um, in Finland. Uh, he or she has a right uh, to um, follow the curriculum so, so that uh, learn according to car curriculum, uh, but we adjust the curriculum so that um, the learning can happen and, and the child can learn. For instance, um, uh, if we look at the, uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be um, yeah, unexpectedly long it, yeah. answer. Uh, yeah. So uh, please feel free to interrupt if needed. But yeah, maybe, maybe um, you could make it shorter because we have a lot more yeah. questions. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. If you have any documents to share, that will also be very useful. But the answer itself is very, you know, useful. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I understand, and and I can see also uh, from the questions and answers session that probably uh, some of the questions uh, will take such a long answer that we are not able to uh, finish this um, if if we um, discuss it now. So maybe we can find ways to somehow. Uh, 
um, answer them later. But uh, just to mention, uh, for instance, that that um, the solutions we have for the inclusive education, uh, they can be just a variation of teaching groups, um, uh, intensifying the collaboration between the parents uh, or the home and school, for instance, or um, uh, having a study assistant with the with the uh, student. So many many ways to do it. This is not an exhaustive list in any way, and I will um, yeah. But maybe I will stop here. Uh, hopefully, it will gi give you a little idea, and then uh, we can continue um, in more um, detail if, if needed. Thank you. Thank you. What we will do is to pick up some of this, and if you have any documents, etc., we'll share with all. We have another question for our expert from Finland, and also I know may feel free to join. Um, this is about the role of private sector. In Kerala, uh, the private sector has played a big role in education and um, in the institutions such as the CMI, uh, as um, Father Prashant mentioned, you know, runs hundreds of institutions in India. Um, you mentioned education is free in Finland. So do you actually have a private sector presence in Finland? And if they are there, are they part of the free system or is there some sort of a um, paid system? How does it work? Thank you. Either of you can pick up. Well, I can, I can take this one. Um, as the system has been developing, the, the public schooling is the norm. Uh, it's trusted the most parents take their kids to the closest neighborhood school. It's also highly uh, difficult to set up a private school in Finland, so you have to have a very uh, heavy reasons. One of them would be, for instance, a language reason. So in Helsinki, for instance, we have a French school and a German school, uh, which are, uh, and we also have an uh, international school, which is uh, dominantly for the children from the EU organizations. That, so we have a massive uh, uh, offices here where the children of the uh, people in there are going usually dominantly to that school. However, and of course, the university schools are pri uh, private, but uh, there's no fees because it is guarantees, right? And uh, for instance, I can give you a personal example. Uh, my uh, child has uh, uh, several home languages but we are definitely putting uh, putting him to the, he's gonna start schooling soon. So we're gonna definitely put him to the local neighborhood school, which gives him, and, and my reasoning for that is that the academically he's not uh, losing anything on a contrary, and he's integrated into the society better this way because he is going through the schooling with his uh, friends from the neighborhood. Um, hopefully that answered the questions. There's a, the, I could, if you don't mind, there was a question about homeschooling as well, and it's related yes. to this. Uh, I could answer Indeed. that one as well. Indeed, I was able to, able to answer <laughs> yeah. Good. Great minds and all that, isn't it? <laughs> um, so the homeschool is also very rare. Uh, it is possible, but only very few cases uh, take the opportunity. Uh, it can be utilized also in a cases where a Finnish family uh, relocates to abroad for a year, but they don't want to uh, put their children into a local school for the such a short period of time. Um, so they have a support, they have a materials and, and uh, how to teach at home if required. But as said, most of the people uh, do not take this option because the school also provides the social aspects for the life and teaches all the other life skills that uh, apart from the academics as well. Thank you, Minna. Um, does Uni or Anu want to add anything since you know about the Kerala system and how, um, you know, if it has any relevance in the private sector context? When I moved to Finland, uh, the problem was we were not having uh, English schools there. So we opted for the available English schools, but the uh, uh, good thing was that all the schools were free, even though they were having a different curriculum. My, my children studied in IB curriculum, which is not the regular Finnish curriculum, but the school, school were still free. But still in Helsinki, we have a few schools which 
and pay. But the, except one school, all these fees are very affordable. So I think Finland is keeping the thing in a social context that uh, schooling and education should not be very expensive. That is the primary concept they are having. But for this one school, they, it is actually meant for diplomats and other people. So, so that, that's a little expensive. Otherwise, it is quite uh, managed by the society very well that people get education and people get options for education. Thank you. Maybe I'll turn to Nereja. Uh, I understand you went for a uh, visit to Finland to learn about the um, the teaching system there. So can you tell about you know a couple of things which you found interesting in actually the way things are taught in the classrooms? Um, in classroom teaching, I uh, have been in a few classrooms class during the class time. So uh, they have, um, uh, if I'm right, they have uh, teacher student ratio, which is uh, 13 is to one or something. So uh, the teacher could manage the students very well. There will be individual attention. They use um, technology to take classes. You know, uh, online uh, softwares are there. So computers are there. So students are allowed to you know, keep their tabs or something in the classroom for learning purpose. So the students are, you know, they are very uh, happy, looking happy in the classroom. They are attentive. Uh, they are relaxed in the classroom. So uh, this is what I, um, this is what something that strike, you know, uh, when I'm, since I'm a person from India or Kerala, so our classroom culture is a bit different from all these things. So uh, we have a more rigid, you know, kind of, classroom environment they have more flexible and the teachers are teachers have extremely you know they are um, they have the freedom to choose what to teach how to teach uh, how to handle the children the system trusts them so um, that's a huge responsibility of course so this is what I found I loved it actually we have a question from Ishika Das um, it is, I was so curious about the integration of subjects that take place in the Finnish school. I had read that concepts of separate subject has been removed from the education system. And I was curious to know how it works. Now, this has been in news a year or two back. And I am, I, I'm actually keen to know, learn about that myself. Well, I think this is, yeah, I think this is one of those, uh, no, I think we, we can answer this together. These are one of those myths that uh, continue to circulate the, the globe, uh, same as the Finnish children don't have any homework or no exams at all. So these are the, the myths that we're trying to, with Rico, when we're talking with our uh, uh, partners, we're trying to tell them these are, you know, not so true. Rika, okay. you want to you wanna answer on this one? Yeah, but of course, uh, it's a lovely myth, really. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the, of course, we've been uh, promoting, for instance, phenomenon based learning uh, in our schools, especially for upper, upper uh, classes. Um, and, um, and there are uh, project type learning, for instance, where, where um, the students and teachers together, they select a phenomenon which they want to explore. Um, and then, of course, it can take um, some math, some geography, for instance, uh, biology, whatever. Languages, you can combine yeah. several subjects. So it's it's really an interesting approach. Um, and maybe if 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 um, somebody is really interested, um, Kirsti Longa, Professor Kirsti Longa, who is uh, from the University of Helsinki, um, she has published a lot about this. So we are happy to give links to to Kirsti's books as well. Um, for phenomenal learning and, and how how to go about it also yeah thank you Rika I you know <laughs> it's interesting to know to know how how, how authoritatively the myth goes around the world I have been thinking it's true myself so we have a question for Anup uh, or Unni this is from Manasi Sharma who asked um, she's an educator with the teach for India program which is a very interesting voluntary activity 
uh, with a lot of young minds uh, in India from IT sector in particular, going to teaching for one or two years. So her question is, currently I'm placed in an underprivileged school where I teach science to the 10th grades. I find it difficult to engage and build sense of curiosity in these young minds. How do you suggest should I go about it? So the type of work which you did in some of the Indian schools, do you have any insights to give? Anup or Unni can take, yeah. Unni can. Okay. Uh, so yes, thanks, thanks for the question. Actually, uh, we have uh, one Teach for India, ex Teach for India fellow working for us, uh, who has already worked in uh, some, uh, like, how do you say, um, rural areas. So basically our, our modules are like such that uh, it's not delivered in a way that, okay, this is, you have to study this kind of, it's, a, it's more of a, a fun uh, kind of a thing. For example, um, like it, it could be like uh, while teaching, uh, like maybe a little bit boring subjects like waste management or uh, sustainability for very, very young children. But then it includes a lot of activities like games and uh, uh, which uh, also makes them think so that it's not just they are not restricted to thinking that, oh, okay, I need to read this and uh, I need to understand that there is some test coming. So, I mean, uh, whatever the age of the child is, like if you say that, okay, we are going to do this and uh, uh, we are actually, first we are going to make this, this is a challenge that we need to solve. That kind of an approach is what we are actually facing. I mean, we are actually doing. Uh, so, I mean, I hope that answers the question. So, we, instead of just going there and saying that we are going to teach some concept, we are actually working together with the children to achieve something. That's the approach we are taking from. Thank you. Um, Nancy can probably get in touch with Unni bilaterally and understand some of the approaches. So, we have a question from Sharif, um, who is asking about the yeah, so he has actually two questions, but I will uh, ask you to focus on, on the second part. The first is about your secondary education system. So could you elaborate a little bit more? But the question which I found more interesting is that what are the challenges which the Finnish system faced in implementing these educational reforms? Um, to elaborate it further, was it from the parents who are apprehensive about the new system? Was it from the politicians? You know, or was it from the teachers themselves about educational reforms? And what are the current debates in the Finnish education system? Over to Mina or thank you. Well, I guess there is uh, always resistance from some people on the change. And of course, uh, currently, obviously, the new uh, new national core curriculum and so, uh, well not currently just before the pandemic there was a lot of a uh, lot of discussions are we giving too much freedom to the children already are we uh, not guiding them enough anymore with the new curriculum um, but again uh, this is uh, these there's always going to be someone who uh, and there's uh, many aged uh, teachers from different uh, different decades who have getting the different training as well teaching in a different context in the country. So of course, and this is a healthy debate and necessary in order to uh, uh, make sure that the system works. Uh, so the criticism and the especially constructive criticism is always a good thing. So of course there has been a resistance on, on many things as well as a positive feedback. Um, it's been decades. So I'm sure there are many things that uh, uh, I'm not even aware of. Um, of course, it started before my time. But uh, of course, these are not painless uh, processes, but they're slow. And when, when you can uh, prove uh, academically that it's a research base, that this works, uh, people tend to believe that over here and that quiets down the discussion. Um, of course, there's always debate on the funds as everywhere else in the world. Are, they, are people paid enough? Are there enough resources allocated to these? Are the school buildings uh, large enough to uh, handle these things? But these are practical matters that um, are left to decide on the budget uh, questions, not on the, on the policy level. But generally, I think there is a, a general consensus that the Finnish education system works. The parents trust the schooling, uh, as evident by the public being so strong in this country. Uh, parents trust the teachers, uh, and, uh, and the teachers are led by uh, very, very uh, capable principals. 
And this is also something that we hear uh, often from the teachers as well, that they have very good principal who knows how to lead the, the community. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question, maybe Rico has something to add on this. Mm, I think we, we just have to move on. It's, it's, it's a really good question, really interesting question also, but let's not, uh, let's not de uh, deliberate more on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, we have, uh, you know, like any system, you would also have similar challenges. Uh, there's a question, um, probably to Nereja, uh, but also um, to Min, Min and Rika. This is about, you know, how, how can somebody in India or another country get an opportunity to come and learn more about the system? So Nereja can explain probably how she got to go there. And maybe Minna can explain how in the new context of not being able to travel, do you have a continued visit program? Nirji, you want to start your mic is mute. Should I start? <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yeah. If Nirji can, can I... start, and then, then I'll ask Rika. Nirji. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, you know, applied when the application was open in the HY plus website. So they have various programs. This one was an individual, you know, uh, an individual can apply for that, but there are uh, various programs for groups as well. So mine was an visit program, uh, which was one week long. Um, it, there was, you know, there were lectures from experts, from teachers, from, um, you know, experts from special education field, and we had visits also. Uh, everything was pre-planned, so we'll get a schedule uh, when we, even when we start from here. So it's like that. I don't know uh, what's the what's their current strategy or. So uh, I think uh, I mean I can explain it. Yeah. You know, Rick, Rick, I can. Rick, I can probably ask what's the current status of the visit program. Uh, well, if if I take uh, the first um, word, um, yeah, uh, certainly uh, like Neraja um, described. So uh, we uh, let's say before the pandemic, uh, we certainly we had the what we call open edu visits. Uh, so anybody uh, could uh, register and join uh, the, the program in Finland. But of course, most of our uh, visits, even at that time, were organized for um, specific groups. So, so we we um, were contacted, for instance, um, by by uh, companies or uh, schools, uh, school chains, for instance, um, and then organized customized um, visits for them so that was um, um, that was before the pandemic and of course we are hoping also to to continue in this um, um, uh, providing visits um, as soon as it's possible but meanwhile uh, we've been working on um, a virtual edu visit or virtual visits and um, well uh, it's still, um, a little bit work in progress, but um, I think it will make a good substitute also. Uh, of course, it's always best if you come to Finland and, and really uh, you can um, see for yourself and, and, and uh, speak with teachers and students and so on. But we are trying to organize this opportunity also virtually uh, if we are not allowed to travel. And Minna will, Minna will add uh, to this. Yeah, I think the problem is that uh, since the situation is, uh, even if you're allowed in the country, we can't uh, take uh, uh, groups to the schools at the moment. And that would be a pity not to be able to uh, uh, visit the schools. This is, of course, to protect the children as well as the, the faculty over there. So we can't uh, take any risks. Um, but we also uh, we also organize master classes so, so for the group so we do uh, and we hope to continue there to visit as soon as possible after the you know world goes back to its normal normality and as Rico said hopefully we get the virtual edu visits uh, up and running soon enough so we can share our knowledge that way 
uh, additionally, we, of course, we have uh, master classes that we offer now. We can do them online that uh, can focus on a special topic and, and take, for instance, five days at the moment. And, and we, can, we can do that, but um, just be in touch and we'll, we'll figure out something at this stage. We are, we are also, uh, same as our schools, we are also reacting on in an in everyday basis on a different situation and, and things, are, things are liquid at the best as it is. Thank you, Minna. We look forward to your virtual visit programs. At least, I think this summer we may have to make do with it. And um, as and when you have information, please share with us and also this audience. We have come to the scheduled end time of the session, but we have still more than 75% of the people whom we started with, which is absolutely amazing. You know, normally we don't, you know, we, we have, you know, huge dropouts, you know, it really shows the interest. We also have a lot, lot more questions remaining. So if you don't mind, I would like to request you to stay back for a little bit more time to answer some of the questions. But since Dr. Martin is here and we had actually scheduled his speech at um, 6.55 Indian time, I would actually um, give him the floor so that based upon his wide experience, he could give some reflections and then we will continue with our question and answer session. Dr. Martin Malak holds a PhD in education from Maharaja Krishna Kumar Singh Ji, Avnagar University, Gujarat. He has served as a principal of institutions like St. Thomas School, Mahua, Gujarat, St. Mary School, Bhavnagar, Gujarat, St. Xavier School, Junagat, Gujarat, etc. He also served as a coordinator, Christ Group of Schools, Bangalore, as well as President INAX Dashcourt Unit, while coordinating the academic and co-curricular activities of all Catholic schools of Saurashtra and Kutch. He also served as the Director, Department of Education of the Diocese of Rajkot, Gujarat. Currently, he holds the position of the Secretary, General Department of Education and Media at the CMI. The, the names of the schools which are read out are some of the best schools. Um, so we are actually listening to somebody who has really hands-on experience in schooling and school administration. So, sir, uh, Father, we are looking forward to your where you know your remarks, and uh, you know if you have any questions or comments to raise, please feel free to raise. Please feel free to stay with us for some more time. We have you know actually stayed for the entire duration of this session, which we appreciate a lot. Also, Father Prasam, we really appreciate. I wanted to give you a chance to ask some questions in case, but you also have a chance coming up after this. Father, you have this floor. You are on mute currently, but you can unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murli. Thank you all the panelists for this fruitful evening. I have heard a lot about the Finnish education system. Uh, since I've been mean, from the school education background, uh, as much interested uh, in this topic of uh, Finnish education. But I got a chance to know more about it from the persons who practice and profess it and the budget. Thank you, Ms. Minna and uh, Ms. Rika. Ms. Minna had explained it systematically to us. And she has explained the different avenues of cooperation also to us. COVID-19 has created a crisis in education all over the world, not only in India or in Kerala, all over the world, it has created a crisis. Practically, schools and colleges could not conduct classes in the regular normal mode all over the world this year. Online classes have been going on in different ways, but I don't think uh, they could substitute the regular normal mode. Moreover, it was a new approach in education, so naturally it takes time to the new normal. <clears throat> the input by Ms. Mina on how Finland managed to impact education during the pandemic was really useful. 
we can learn from their lessons. <clears throat> Any system or practice that has succeeded in one place need not be a success everywhere in the world. But lessons can be learned from the success stories of others. There's a tendency to copy, to replicate any success story, whether it is of individual or institutions. We have to see what we can learn from anybody's success experience, interpreting that to our life context. The ideal way of adopting the success story of Finnish education system to our land India has to be explored more and more, especially in the context of skill development envisaged in the new National Education Policy 2020, as uh, Nirja has pointed out. Training in independent thinking skills is something that we have learned from Finnish system. That is what I feel. Instead of being carried away by the rhetoric of leaders, Children should be trained to think and act as independent thinkers. I think in the Indian context, we have to stress on that. Another webinar on topics such as leadership from distance, hybrid model of teaching, etc., uh, mentioned by Mina, can be thought of by the organizers. Thanks to all the organizers, the CMI, such college, Venture Village, Helsinki University, and our dear moderator, Dr. Murli, for this wonderful, fruitful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Father Martin. Your cooperation, that of CMI, as well as the Secretariat College, has been extremely instrumental in getting as the audience, but also the right audience, you know, people who are educators, education administrators, etc. And our collaboration with SS College is long-standing, and we continue to work with you and your institutions as we progress with other webinars. Um, I now want to give an option to our dear participants who are around. I know many of you may actually feel very guilty if you to leave the session. But we know that the time which we planned is now over. So if some of you actually leave, no, don't feel bad that you are abandoning us midway because you have stayed us for all time. But we will be continuing this session at least for next 20 to 30 minutes to answer some of the questions. But before you leave, I will ask both um, Unni as well as Minna to give a two minute pitch on what exactly somebody should do if they want to get in touch with you to understand more about you know, how to cooperate, how to register for, et cetera, Unni. Okay, uh, thank you so again. Uh, so uh, anybody who wants to get in touch with us, at least uh, you will be getting this, uh, uh, the materials that we shared uh, immediately after this webinar, it will be sent to your email uh, in which you have listed. Also, there is uh, our website, venturevillage.in, as well as venturevillage.world. You can uh, always come in and look at uh, the services that we are uh, providing. And like uh, we have mentioned uh, the different collaborations that we have. And uh, uh, please fill in the forms, contact forms, or like there are emails mentioned, you can actually send us emails about it. And we will be very, very uh, happy to help. Uh, we are already doing a few things uh, right now as we speak. Uh, quite many uh, students are actually doing this program. And we will be actually uh, starting uh, some more programs, uh, especially this Green City uh, program after the uh, exams that we will have in March. So if uh, any of you uh, or any of your schools want to uh, uh, cooperate with us, uh, either you can uh, send an email, which I would, uh, maybe after I talk, I would actually type in. Or uh, you can actually uh, find out the contact details from our website and email us. There are forms for specific programs. We'll be very, very happy to help. Thank you, Unni. Um, I know you are always you know, free to jump in anytime. I'm just calling Unni at random. Um, same about Minna and Rika. You know, between the two of you, please feel free to 
um, answer what exactly somebody should do should they want to get in touch with you. Okay, so as as Unni said, uh, the, there will be an email sent after this uh, event. There will be my presentation there and uh, both myself and Rika's contact details as well as the contacts for our web page. Uh, and please uh, scan the QR code, you can find me in LinkedIn as well. Both of us are very happy to continue the, the topic of the keynote today about discussing um, the Finnish education system and, and maybe some of the questions we don't even have time to answer. We're always happy to discuss those. And uh, as uh, Father Martin said, uh, you can't uh, import uh, a full Finnish education system, but we are very skillful of finding creative solutions on different uh, topics and, and discuss on, on the challenges that you're facing. And hopefully we can, we can find the collaborative uh, ideas for those outside even the ones that I presented today. So please be in touch uh, in the low threshold and, and let's continue the conversation. Thank you, Minna. I noticed that only 10 people actually left after I gave them the offer, which you know just shows how much of interest is still there. Father Prasant, I, um, you know, most of the discussion has been on the school uh, education. And since you come from the higher education segment, um, if you want to ask a question or make a comment on the potential collaboration, or not collaboration, but sharing of information um, on the Finnish higher education system, you have the floor now. Otherwise, I will ask a simple question. Thank you. Uh, no, I have a couple of comments. I already made those comments on the screen. One was regarding uh, the new development. Maybe Nirja already referred to it. That the NEP provides for educators being educated and the new mm. platform for four-year program in which all of us can be definitely involved. And it seems to be a fascinating world altogether. Because I think that teacher education is the key to all, all, the, all that is being spoken about. When we think about in introducing these kind of uh, reforms, uh, what is uh, who, uh, the, the group we need to get cooperation and uh, support is the teacher group. And they need to be educated. And the educational pattern, how the teacher is being educated is something uh, we need to look at. And um, that is the domain of higher education as to how the teachers should be educated. And it is uh, the new education policy speaks about integrating uh, the component into the uh, mainstream so that a teacher would be educated throughout the four years of training and uh, regularly exposed to the field of education. And by the end of the fourth year, um, maybe equipped in one domain and also in teaching. So that seems to be a beautiful thing. That is one observation I would like to make and I'm eager to see how this is happening in the Finnish education. Uh, second is regarding the private uh, sector. I, I belong to, I don't say exactly private, but we are public, but uh, voluntary kind of sector being supported by the government in very many ways. But what is the role they could uh, can, uh, play? And is there any role at all for the private domain uh, in uh, or the voluntary sector in as far as education in Finland is concerned? And now as far as India is concerned, they, to a great extent, we are dependent on that and uh, whether there is uh, any insight uh, for that sector uh, as far as um, uh, uh, drawing uh, learnings from uh, Finnish model is concerned. Thank you. Um, Minna, but I would like you to then reflect on any other country where you have worked on, where you may have come across the similar issue of the a private sector playing an increased role. So over to you, Minna Rika. <clears throat> what we have noticed is that uh, globally was, of course, uh, yes, when I say that the Finland has a dominantly public sector, this is of course a historical fact. We have worked towards that, the decision will, we, we do understand the value of the private sector. Of the same uh, same laws apply there as well, in, uh, meaning that you have to have quality teachers, quality leadership, uh, and the good school culture and uh, implementation of curriculum. So we're talking about basically the same things. Um, what we have noticed uh, when working uh, globally, 
that a quite a lot of uh, public-private partnerships have been formed, which is a, one of the way to bridge the gap between the, the um, public and a private. So private definitely has a place in the societies and, and serving, uh, serving the education system. And uh, it's also a way that we've been working. So the private public is, uh, is one way of uh, working, at least that's how I see the thing. Uh, the topic, I'm sure, but um, maybe uh, there was actually a question in the questions and answers lesson uh, or, or that part about um, how, how uh, private sector in education Absolutely. and, and uh, um, this is also a very uh, relevant question uh, since in many countries um, the, let's say that the private sector um, in education in a way carries the quality of the education whereas the public sector um, really um, needs capacity building um, also and when we are um, heading for a reform, um, I somehow, um, we have experience from different countries, for instance, from Nigeria, um, where once again, the private sector really dominates uh, the whole education sector. Well, um, really uh, cannot provide um, good quality education for, for, for those um, who, who, who are within the public um, sector. And I somehow see as a solution uh, also um, um, that we should in, include, not exclude the private sector uh, if we are doing uh, or carrying out um, or helping in carrying out the private sec uh, public sector um, reform, but we should somehow uh, find um, a dialogue and, and collaboration also there. It's not easy, I know, but uh, this is just something I, I wanted to add. Thank you, Mirna. There's this, uh, I know you wanted to say something. We were trying to build some cooperation, educational cooperation from Finland to Kerala uh, after the 2018 flood, actually. Then uh, we, we realized that it is too difficult for, for um, to penetrate this bureaucratic war. So basically, uh, private institutions uh, for cooperation between India and Finland, because they can make decisions by themselves, especially autonomous. So, and also, apart from SY Plus, we had with a uh, few other educational institutions, Oulu University, and also Lapinranda, it's another region. So all of them were keen and eager to build academic cooperations with India. So basically, there is a huge uh, opportunity and, and market for, for all kinds of educational cooperation. For example, from Lafti, it's a different region. They are very much interested in green energy and green technology because they are focusing on that. And so I, I already mentioned to Father Prashant about this opportunity. We, we have these discussions going on. And of course, there is a, a lot of chances for private institutions to come in and to collaborate and cooperate with uh, institutions in Finland. And we, we are really glad to help for that. And we have HOA Plus as our partner, but also we have connections to some other universities. And also these universities are a consortium. They, they help each other in building all this. Not only they are doing it for themselves. So it's a, it's a big possibility. Thank you. Um, I know, thank you, Minna. I, um, you know, there is, there are a series of questions about um, a topic which Nandita uh, is also very interested in and um, has been writing extensively on. This is about sex education. So how is sex education handled in the Finnish education system? And was it a part of the reform process? Um, is there anything interesting which other countries in your experience find interesting? Um, over to you, Rika Nina. I think you caught me on something that is in the, in the curriculum that I'm not actually aware of uh, in terms of the reform. Um, I don't think this has ever been an issue 
uh, if uh, anything, if the sexual uh, education has been increased over the years, of course, the, the importance of it, but I don't think it has ever been in the center of uh, debate over here. Uh, Rika, can you elaborate? Do you have anything to add? Mm, yeah, um, I'm not an expert uh, in this matter. If um, we could, of course, find out um, and check check uh, the current curriculum, national core curriculum. We know it's there, um, uh, but uh, I don't know how much uh, or at all if if it, if they changed it uh, when when um, creating the new curriculum. So th this is something I'm not aware of, but it's it's included in the curriculum. That's for sure. Yeah, and has been for decades. Mm -hmm. That, that yeah, we know. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Rika. Nerida, do you want to reflect on your visit and um, did you have a discussion on this topic and did you find anything interesting or different from what you are familiar with in India? Uh, yes, actually, uh, they have uh, sex and relationship education, but it's, you know, it's a gradual process. Um, in every classes, in almost every subjects, uh, it is included, especially like it's like in health sciences sometimes or in social sciences or social aspects and legal issues like that. So it is there. Um, I think um, the new education policy, it's almost untouched area. So uh, I think we need to work on it. We don't have uh, a clear, you know, a clear structure or sex and relationship education right here. Um, if I may add, I mean, this is uh, obviously, this is a question of the life skills and, and well-being of the students. Um, and these have been, as Nira said, uh, in integrated on the, on the everyday life because the school's uh, purpose is not only give academic uh, knowledge, but more importantly, grow uh, competent, uh, independent adults who are able to take care of themselves. And obviously this is a vital part of, uh, of that, uh, including uh, physical health. Uh, this is part of the physical health uh, aspects of the curriculum, of course. Thank you, Nina. I know for only do you want to ask parents, you know, who probably have children in the school, um, can you reflect on, you know, how is it different from the type of education you received? Yeah, only is having a very small child, but my, my children are a little more older. She's now 23. Mm -hmm. so yes. when she was in the school and when she was on the transformational stage with his with her second. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful that she got all the information from the school and from the teachers, and then she was quite aware of the thing. Okay, so this kind of uh, timely awareness given to the girls, uh, that also inspired us, and also we are now uh, uh, introducing our, our uh, co-curricular module on girls' health and menstruation, uh, menstrual health, uh, by February 15th, I think, at the timeline we fixed. So it is a, a kind of self-learning uh, module which the girl child or, or the uh, girl can uh, discuss the things and learn the things along with their mother. So it's a self-learning thing. It's a, it's a, the information is available online and, and she can <clears throat> learn it with her, with her mother. This is a thing we learned from Finland. Like, you know, this should be there. It, it should be taught, but we have to give some time for the girl to uh, learn that thing in her own pace and a complete sense. So that's uh, uh, what I have to add on this, but it is there. Thank you, Anu. I think once again, if there is some information in English uh, on this topic, it will be very useful if you can share with the participants. And Father Prashant, did we have something? Did Prashant Not raise exactly. the hand to say something or was he say bye to somebody who was passing? Exactly. I thought the discussion was getting over and uh, suddenly it dawned on me that nowadays uh, we are having too much of uh, stress being given on outcome-based education. I don't say it is too much, but then there's a recent trend. So this is more from the West and it is from Bloom's taxonomy and uh, 
So how, whether this is being taken into account when curriculum is being planned and uh, delivered uh, in uh, the school system itself. Uh, and uh, among that, one of the outcomes which I desire as uh, rightly pointed out right now by Mina is how to live well. So living well also would mean uh, right kind of interpersonal relationships, not only confined to sex and such relationships, but also peace. So conflict resolution. So these two things, one is regarding uh, whether outcome-based education is being in some way uh, focused on and is uh, peace and conflict resolution part of the, uh, the gradual education system that uh, as, as being uh, said about sex education, is, is that being integrated into the curriculum in, a, in, a, in an incremental manner? This is my question. Thank you, Father. May now Rick, I want to... I think it's a great idea. I think this is, uh, I mean, all, all, of, all I know, we are looking at what we can only give them what we give them in the schools in those years when they, when they are in there. And after that, they, they have to take care of themselves. So uh, peace and conflict resolution is one, one of very important things in the, in the modern day world as well. And I, I, you know, I think that's a great idea to integrate it into the education system. Ultimate the goal is to create competent adults uh, who are kind to their society, productive uh, part of the society, and, and generally good people. That's, that's the ultimate goal. All the rest of the academics they can learn and uh, outside even on the schoolyard. But this is something that is extremely important. Thank you, Minna. Now we have a question coming on the training on coding. You know, this is the uh, new IT revolution. And um, around the world, you actually have a, more or less a race to bottom as to how early should you know, children be taught. In the high school is being trained in Dubai. They are saying everyone at the age of seventh grade is being told. And in other places, they are even trying to bring it down. And there are private sector providers who are trying to capitalize on this as a, uh, as a market because parents think, you know, everyone should be, um, so do you have any um, dialogue on this? Um, do you already have this in your curriculum or any plans? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the coding is, uh, first of all, I don't know how to code, but my kid has uh, capabilities of understanding how it mentality works, even though obviously he can code or program it. Um, it's funny since uh, he just turned five and we got him this little uh, toy robot that teaches you how to think like a coder. So it's not meant to have, um, because the coding is a language. So it's a, the, the way I consider it is that it's, uh, um, it teaches him another language, the way to think, to, uh, the way to uh, process things instead of, I don't expect him to start coding apps and programs and things, but Uh, it's uh, to uh, help him and support him on doing that. If, uh, but I'm not forcing him to learn coding. Um, coding is part of the curriculum already in the uh, primary school. Um, there is uh, some, some some schools can use uh, you know robots, but the idea is that they start thinking how the coding language works, not to be able to code necessarily. But understand that if I add this to this, then in the, the robot does this. So it's just the basic getting uh, getting your mind ready for that kind of idea. Because at some point they will need to know how to code. I might be able to get through my life without le learning that. Thank you, Minna. I want to yourself. You're recording for a living, I suppose. But I did not see coding as one of your offerings in the... Uh, in venture village. So I would like to know uh, what's your take on it. Actually, uh, as a person who is even now working with a lot of IT and code and code development and product development, there is a going trend that the code is actually disappearing. You don't need to code anymore. Because the thing is that it's always about uh, connecting logical uh, components to get something working. So uh, I, I, I've been in a situation where I have to write code from scratch, but then I've been in situations where it has already been written. I can just use it 
and because uh, we always choose easier options so there are always components available that you can actually reuse so i we ha we don't have that or even i i don't i, I mean uh, using tools and implementing and using it in different ways is what even i am focusing on my children here uh, like because um, i am not saying that coding is actually going to disappear completely but then the thing is that uh, there is a trend that uh, um, it's not that we might not need code but then there is a no code movement happening because there is components available for everything even like in a professional uh, like setup so it just it, it, there is always coding required in the research part i'm not denying it but then uh, as a professional uh, thing like there is a trend which is going for no coding so I, i'm not that against coding but then i'm just saying that this is the trend so thank you unni uh, we have um, you know exceeded by 24 minutes i want to thank all the speakers for staying some extra time and i would probably take just one more question before i ask um, all of you to probably reflect 30 seconds on your final thoughts we have a question from gina who is actually currently living in finland in olu and is from kerala and uh, she is asking you know you know she has been following the finnish education system and very appreciative um how would it work in a place like kerala where the population density is high probably she means not so much the population density but the student to teacher ratio is higher so i would like to ask if you have an experience in another country where you are introducing it where you have you know higher population and higher ratio of teacher to student well uh, i have to say that basically everywhere we work uh, is a higher ratio <laughs> uh, and also population density because again we come from the country of your neighbors are far away from you and and there's a lot of empty space here um, but of course this is uh, this comes down to the um uh, teachers education and how they can manage the larger groups and how to organize the lessons and how to organize the the flow of the day um of course there's an idea numbers are there but we also have in finland we have smaller schools where the teacher uh, village schools um where the teacher has to teach classes from 3 uh, to 5 in the same classroom and and they have managed uh, i personally come from that kind of school uh, back in the day i did my primary schooling like that in a, in a smaller village school where um a teacher handled at the at best the uh, third to fifth graders yes in in the same classroom a uh, lot more than the recommended number and they still managed so Thank there you. are uh, so there are things and solutions that we can also uh, share on this thank you you know the questions keep coming and many of them are interesting so i um, i really apologize but i want i have to ask just one more question this uh, is about um, assessment of students regarding their their aptitude you know this is a question which keeps coming around the world as to you know can you actually do some sort of an assessment to understand students aptitudes and calling is there something like that in the finish system and if it if yes is it one step process or a continuous process and i think that will be the last question i thank all those who have asked the questions and i know you have a lot more questions we will continue this we'll share the emails but you know in order to give everyone you know enough um, you know who have spent more than 2 hours on this 2 and a half hours now will i lot to stop this which is a good problem to have mostly our problem with opposite so one last question mina um in terms of assessments um there are various ways of doing assessments and these are uh, down to the teacher to decide how they do it um each student has even on the upper levels they do have a one teacher that is responsible of that class even though they have uh, subject teachers um in the primary school these are the class teachers so the system is of course also based on the fact that the teacher knows the students and there there is the drafted internet uh, individual learning plans um for each students to uh, which also discuss on the learning targets and also um early intervention models where you contact the parents as soon as there seems to be problems or address uh, issues fast but of course this is based on, on the teachers knowing 
and being able to intervene when uh, when there's uh, when there's issues. Also, this goes to if somebody is uh, academically more gifted and and they need to have more uh, challenging uh, work or uh, help their uh, their uh, classmates or things. So the but in order, it's very rare. Um, because of the because of this, it's not, it's a holistic approach to the student as well. Are they ready to move up uh, on other levels, even though they're very gifted on something? Um, did I answer the question? I'm not sure. A part of the question was about you know doing all this psychological assessment as to you are more fit to be a doctor or an engineer. So do you have some? Ah, so, so we're talking about the career opportunities. Of course, there is a, there is a, a guidance in, provided in schools for this as well. Um, but also the, the journey is supposed to be that the people also, uh, you know, the teachers nurture the, um, the good sides of you and, and encourage you on the things that you are excited and, and support you on the things that you are not um, and they do guide you towards um, your career opportunities. But of course, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation as well, when you're 16 and you're supposed to make the first big decision, uh, you might be too young to make that. But the, the system allows you to uh, bounce back, uh, change the directions, uh, change your mind. Um, so uh, there are only few few students who already know at the age of 16 what they really want to be when they grow up. But we try to su uh, support them in schools as well and, and help them to think what is their right career choice. Thank you, Minara. Back, back, you know, back here, you know, parents actually know even before the children are born, <laughs> the children are going to be. Uh, that's how it works here. But um, clearly, I think the opportunity to bounce back is absolutely important and the new education policy for the first time gives us that flexibility and we are very excited about it. So we are 7.30. If anybody want to make any final last pitch points, feel free. Uh, otherwise, I would uh, thank all of you and conclude. So Uni, do you want to make anything or anybody want to say any last words before I close? Uh, my name is more of a process related. I will be, send, or will be sending out the email immediately after this uh, session is over. So you'll be getting the uh, links uh, to where the presentation materials are and also a few more details of what was discussed. So that will be sent out quite soon, within five minutes, I guess. Thank you, Unni. Anu, any last words? No, okay, Mina. I just, uh, I, I think I spoke enough about the topic, but I wanna uh, send a message to all the educators, teachers, principals, school leaders out there. Um, Hang in there, it's tough. You're in the front line and, uh, and there is a international community supporting and I'm so happy to see everybody around here. We are all fighting the big fight here now. Thank you, Mina. I think the type of um, heroic fight which our teachers have done is uh, probably underappreciated. The doctors and nurses on the front line, of course they get a lot of visibility but as you mentioned, you know, switching onto an entirely new way of teaching within 48 hours, you know, has been quite heroic. And when it comes to, you know, places like ours where teachers have all type of challenges, you know, from you know, what type of instruments they have, how much bandwidth they have, and how little technological training they have had, you know, I find what our teachers have done is absolutely, truly heroic, and I'm sure We'll have time to celebrate it once we are over this tunnel, um, which I'm sure we will all get through. Father Prasant, any final words? Yeah, uh, thank you for this uh, fabulous opportunity. I think this is a very interesting session, and I look forward to continued collaboration. I think we'll build on this in our Thank you. Rika? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, everybody uh, for today. It has been really, uh, really valuable experience uh, and uh, things here. And definitely we will um, continue the collaboration and, and let's see uh, what we can achieve together. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. Nirja, do you want to make any final remarks? <laughs> 
first of all, thank you so much uh, to be here for everyone. And I'm much honored to be here, actually. Uh, so it was a great discussion. Uh, very well, you know, uh, there were a lot of questions and, you know, looking forward to such, such sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Neeraja. You can see on the right side on the chat, you know, it is exploding with uh, thank you to all the panelists. And uh, you know, we have <clears throat> more than 157 people who have come in um, who are still with us, you know, you know, doing this almost for a living almost every other day. I can tell you that this is truly exceptional. This just shows the value. So let's continue with this uh, dialogue. Please keep an eye on our Page. Please continue to send our way any new interesting insight you have. And um, I thank all the participants who came, listened to us, and left, and those who are staying with us. Prashant, please convey our thanks to Martin, as well as all the teachers, educators, and the CMI for the support you provided. Thank HY Plus, thank Venture Village, thank Mentor Plus, and also thank Tommy, whom the participants probably don't see, but who has been the heart of this presentation, who has been ensuring seamlessly. So have a good evening, Helsinki. Have a good uh, night, India, and have a good morning in some places <laughs> where you people are joined from. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.